going to do something different. I normally have a handouts and we fill in the blanks. I'm not doing that today. And I just, if you let me, I just want to speak from my heart. Can I do that? Because God laid something on my heart. And I need to tell a story to be able to do this. And it's really the story of Jacob's life. But, you know, it's what God's doing today. God wants to restore people back to himself. And, and we have a large con- tendency of people, particularly in America, who feel like they can't be used by God because they're not perfect enough. How many know it's not about your perfection? It's about the goodness of grace of God that, he ena- that enables him to use you. Yes or no? So I want to talk about this. You can find my notes again on YouTube or our, our app, in the, uh, if, uh, our, our uh, Victory Church NC app. You can download it from your app store if you want to. But I want to talk about this for a few minutes. And I want to start off with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in this world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. And he chose the things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. Anytime God does anything through us, how many know it's not us about us, it's about him? And he's got to get us out of the way. Then 1 Samuel 16, Samuel was a prophet in the Old Testament. God sent uh, Samuel to a man named Jesse's house. He had a bunch of sons, and one of his sons, God said to Samuel, was to be king over Israel. And they brought one of the sons up before Samuel, and, but the Lord said to Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 7, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So I want to talk to you today about the God of Jacob. Now, in Scripture, you'll find the phrase, the God of Jacob, a number of times. Uh, Let me just read a few of the references here. And in the God of Jacob, there's a gem that's hidden there. Really, in the same sentence, to use the name God and Jacob is almost an oxymoron, two absolute opposites joining together because they're so different exodus 3 6 moreover he said i am the god of your father the god of abraham the god of isaac the god of jacob and moses hid his face was afraid to look upon god so the god of jacob is mentioned psalm 20 may the lord answer you in the day of trouble (coughs) excuse me may the god of jacob defend you may he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of zion every time god uses the phrase in the bible the god of jacob There's something being said, and it's hidden, and I want to to, to take it out of hiding today. Psalm 146, verse 5, happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord is God. Psalm 46, 7, the Lord of hosts is with, with us again. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Why would God use the phrase over and over again? The God of Jacob. So I want to tell a little story now. Now, to begin with, how many know God's people that he cut a covenant with upon which the Old Testament was based upon uh, came from the man named Abraham? How many know that? And Abraham, let me talk about Abraham just a minute. Abraham was a man who actually lived in Ur of the Chaldees and the people of Ur of the Chaldees, that city, actually worshipped the moon god. And Abraham's ancestry worshipped the moon god. And God came to a man who did not know him, knew nothing about him, and said, Abram, I want you to get away from your family, get away from everyone that knows you, and come to a place that I've called you to. For from you, I'm going to bless all of the families of the earth. And God made a covenant with Abraham that he would bless the earth eternally and that the people of God would be blessed and people would be blessed in eternity perpetually through Abram. Later, his name was, you know, his name was changed to Abraham. And God, you know the story of Abraham's life, that God in his old age, God gave Abraham and his wife Sarah a child. Abraham was 100 years old. 
Sarah was 90 years old when she had a baby. That's like amazing, right? All the ladies going, Lord, have mercy. You know what I mean? It's really a crazy thing. But God answered the prayer. It took 25 years from the time God promised Abraham uh, that his wife would actually get pregnant until it happened. And everybody thought they were cuckoo when they said, we're going to have a baby. We're going to have a baby. 90 years old, it happened. 100 years old, it has like amazing. It's a miracle. So Abraham was a miracle man. And, and the, the nation of Israel started from Abraham's life. And he's called the father of faith. And we understand that his child of promise that was uh, given to him and Sarah was named Isaac. And the word Isaac means laughter. And so we, we're, I'm going to talk, tell you the story about about Isaac's son named Jacob. And you can find this. I don't have, see, because we have time constraints, I'm really watching the clock. Y'all give me a little bit extra time today because we started late with all we had to do. But uh, anyway, this is found in Genesis 25 to about Genesis 35. I'll tell the story really quickly because there's some real, real interesting points here about how God deals with all of us. And it's found in the story of the God of Jacob. So Isaac uh, married a, a lady named Rebecca. And uh, they had been married for about 20 years. Again, Isaac's dad was Abraham. So here's Isaac. He married Jacob, uh, Rebecca. They'd been married about 20 years. And, and Rebecca began to cry out because during her time, um, you know, if a, if a lady was barren, that was like a curse. And, and you were blessed if you had children. Well, I mean, bottom line, God told Isaac's dad, Abraham, you've got to have a great big family. In fact, see the sand on the seashore, see the stars in the sky. That's how many that's how many kids your family's going to have one day. And so if Isaac never had a child, how's that promise going to be fulfilled? I mean, give me a break. So, so Rebecca cried out. I mean, she cried, God, please. And, um, and 20 years after Isaac and Rebecca were married, she became pregnant. Thank you, God. How many know God doesn't answer every Friday at 3 o'clock your prayer? But if you will believe God and persevere in faith, how many know God will come through? So if you've been believing God, stand your ground and don't relent, don't back up. That's what Rebecca had to do. God, you promised. God, you promised. I'm sure that Isaac said, God, you promised. You promised my daddy. We'll have a big family. What's up? And finally, Rebecca got pregnant. Well, during the pregnancy, of course, you know, she was growing, you know, and, and getting bigger and bigger and came a point in time that that there was a, a tumult in her womb and she figured out she was having twins and they were fighting with each other. Could you imagine ladies being pregnant and the two kids are fighting every day. It's like, be still, I'm trying to eat. Be still, I'm trying to, be still, I'm trying to sleep. And they're just fighting each other all the time. And so finally, the, uh, God spoke to Rebecca and said, Rebecca, two nations are in your womb. And the unusual thing about the boys, well, the, the, the people that will be born, the twins the elder is going to serve the younger. Now, now in Israel during this time, the birthright always belonged to the firstborn. Birthright meant, here's what it meant, birthright in Israel meant the firstborn gets two-thirds of the inheritance from the family, from the father, uh, and, and the, everybody else, regardless of how many siblings they have, they divide the, re- the one-third that's left between all of them. So you get the idea that to be the firstborn's a big deal. And then not only is it a big deal in this family, but God promised Abraham, you're, the whole world's going to be blessed through your family. So it's a big deal to be firstborn uh, uh, in, in Isaac, with Isaac and Rebekah. And that child that was firstborn, big deal. So the day came that Rebekah was going to have the babies and, and out came her firstborn, Esau, and Esau had red hair all over his body. I mean, y'all, he looked about like a bear, had hairy arms, hairy hands, hair all over him, hair on his back, hair on his shoulder. He just had hair everywhere. And then when he was born, she called him Esau, and then his brother, his twin brother came out. When his twin brother was born, he had his hand grabbed a hold of his heel, and he was grabbing him. As if he's trying to pull him back and say, whoa, whoa, you're not supposed to be ahead of me. What are you doing? And he grabbed his heel. And she named his name Jacob. Old English word is supplanter, which means one who puts his heel on another. Or swindler, conniver, a deceitful person. 
A person who gets ahead by swindling other people. That was Jacob, and that was the name his mother gave him from birth. That's interesting. So you got to understand when you're reading the Bible, you'll read one verse, and then before you know it, you're years and years later. So, so Genesis 25, you know, you read about the birth of Esau and Jacob, and Jacob, you know, grabbing his heel. Well, that, and, and often they would give, uh, Bible characters would give their, their children names according to their personality, and they actually lived out that name. So Jacob literally lived out that name, swindler, conniver, deceiver, and that became his character. There's some problems as you read the narrative. Now, as these boys were raised and as they grew up, there were some real problems systemic in the first family of faith, all the way from Abraham, Isaac, here's Isaac, and now and now Jacob and Esau were born. And when Jacob and Esau were born, um, you know, their parents did it all wrong. Mama loved Jacob. And how many know if you're a parent and you favor one child over another, how many know you're going to have some problems? Listen, Susan and I got four kids. You know what we found out? Birthdays, we better do it the same. Uh, Christmas, we better do it the same. You know, if you take one out, we got to take them all out. If we buy one a shirt, got to buy the other one a shirt. You get what I'm saying? And that's just the way it is. Well, they played favorites in their home. They had some real family dysfunction going on in their home. Esau was loved by his daddy Isaac. And Esau was a rugged man. Esau was a man of the earth. Esau was, a, was an outside man. He was, a, he was a man of the woods, a man of the forest. He loved to hunt. He had a bow and arrow. And, and he was just a rough and gruff guy. He was a hairy guy. And he smelled bad about all the time because he was always outside like a, like a third or fourth grader coming into play, you know, from recess. If you're in a classroom, and, mm, what's that? So that's the way he was. And his daddy loved it. And then Esau would kill an animal and then make stew out of the animal. And uh, his daddy just loved the stew that Esau would make. And, and again, Isaac played favorites with Esau. But, but on the other hand, Jacob was favored by his mama. He became mama's boy. Yeah. And uh, instead of being a man of the outdoors, his mama taught him to cook. Doesn't say it in the Bible. She might have taught him how to sew. Yeah, boy, right? Yeah, and, and then and then you know he he was probably of more refined character, perhaps an intellectual. He's a thinker instead of a doer, so he's always scheming. And his mother taught him how to scheme, and he became a schemer. So he was born. He and Esau lived together in the same house. Seventy years later, now nobody ought to be living with mama and daddy at seventy years of age. I mean. You know, you got to understand. Here's one thing you got to understand: biblical narrative. You know, uh, before the fall of man, we were supposed to live eternally in human bodies. But with the fall of Adam and Eve, you know, human life began to go down, down, down. I think the man that lived the oldest was Methuselah, nine sixty nine years, uh, lunar year. I mean, real years, three hundred sixty five day years. And then um, uh, uh, Adam lived nine hundred and thirty years, and down, down, down it went. I think. Uh, I think Abraham, how, how long did he live? He lived a long time. Uh, Isaac, I think he was 180 when he died. So I'm just saying these guys lived a long time. So 70 years of age, I think, uh, I think Jacob lived to be 147, almost 150 years. So that's not a, that's not a, you know, that's half your life still, still at 70 years of age. That's a big deal, right? But it's 70 years of age. 70 years of age, things begin to happen. The biblical narrative, same chapter, um, Esau had been out hunting. He was tired. He didn't catch anything. He didn't kill an animal. He came in. The Bible didn't say how long he was out. Out long enough to be tired, to be hungry, probably thirsty. He comes in the door. And what does he smell? He smells Jacob's stew. And it, Jacob's mama, all these years, both of them 70 years old. And both of them, you know, uh, one, one loved by mama, the other loved by daddy. But he comes in the door he says, man, what is that smell? Jacob said, oh, you like my stew, do you? He said, I love your stew. I need some right now. I am absolutely starving. I have nothing to eat. I didn't kill an animal this time. I, I come back empty-handed. Can I have a bowl of your soup? He said, no, 
none of mine today. No, go make your own. Go back out there and hunt yourself. No, please, what have I got to do just to get a bowl of stew from you? And, uh, and Jacob said, well, I'll tell you what, you sell me your birthright. You give it to me. If you give me your birthright, you get a bowl of stew right now. I'll dip it right now. All you got to do is give me your word that your birthright is mine. And Esau was stupid enough to say, you know what, I am so hungry. I don't care what I may have in the future. I won't have a future if I die of hunger. Give me the stew. You got my birthright. And Jacob said, thank you very much. Dipped him a bowl of stew. Esau ate the stew. And the book of Hebrews says that Esau despised his birthright. Some things in the Bible don't make sense until you understand some things about the character of God. How many God know that God looks at the heart, not the outside? Yes or no? Yeah, yeah. What we do has something to say, but what has more to say to God is what we are on the inside. How many know you can look right on the outside but not be on the inside? How many know you can look wrong on the outside and, and you know what, inside you're doing all you can and, and it just ain't enough sometimes, right? And so that's the way it was with Esau and Jacob. Jacob wanted to do right and the Bible says that uh, God loved Jacob but rejected Esau. In fact, he, he loved some, uh, in fact, Romans 9 said, God said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated and it's not really the word hate in the sense we use it today. He just loved him less. I mean, there was something about, there was something about Esau that was not as attractive to God. And what was it? Esau didn't have, just didn't have a spiritual desire in his life at all. Listen, who was their granddaddy? Abraham was. Have you ever thought about that? Jacob and Esau's grandfather was Abraham. They knew the story. They knew that in an old age, Abraham and Sarah had a baby, their father, and they knew that God had promised Abraham that the whole world would be blessed through their family. So, so Esau knew that, and for 70 years, he heard the stories about Abraham from his father Isaac, and he knew the birthright was a big deal, and you know what? He didn't even care about it. What does that say about Esau? He didn't care about spiritual things. He had it all looking right on the outside, but he didn't have it right on the inside. Opposite of that, here's Jacob, he was a hairless guy, you know, uh, he was, you know, and he was totally different and, and he was a schemer, he was a swindler, took advantage of everybody, but see, he had this one value in his life, he knew what God said to his grandfather and he knew that through his family, the whole world one day would be totally blessed. That was a huge value to a swindler named Jacob. In his heart, he knew God made a promise to Abraham and he so valued that promise, he did it all wrong. He was in the flesh. He didn't do it right, but God saw his heart. How many hear me? And he swindled away the birthright from his older brother and it became his own. It, it, I know it sounds funny to us. How could God even honor that again? God looks on the heart not on the outside. How many who heard him say? Then you fast forward 10 years later and Jacob, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Isaac at that time, their father was about 140 years of age. Again, I think he was about 180 when he died. He was a 140, you imagine being 140 years old, y'all. I mean, he couldn't see. He had physical problems, wasn't very agile. You know, his hearing probably had problems with his hearing as well. And uh, the Bible says that he came, to, uh, he came to Esau and said, Esau, you know, you're my firstborn. And I want to bless you with the blessing of the firstborn. So, you know, before I die, I don't know how much longer I've got. I'm having physical problems. I want you to, I want you to go and take your bow and arrow. You can read it in the, in the scriptural, the biblical narrative. Said, I just want you to take your bow and arrow, and I want you to go out and find an animal, kill it. And then I want you to come back, and I want you to make me that favorite stew that I just love. You just make it so nobody makes this stew like you, Esau. So he said, okay, I can do that, Dad. So he went out, you know, and, and he was gone a long time. The Bible doesn't say how long he was gone, but long enough that, you know, it took him a while. And, and in the meantime, Rebecca, who liked Jacob, his brother, she overheard the conversation with Esau. How many know, parents, you need to be careful how you treat your children? How many hear me? And she told Jacob, look, I overheard your father. 
And he said that he wants to give the birthright to your brother Esau and he wants him to make that stew. But you know what? You're going to pretend like you are Esau and we're going to dress you up, smell you up, look you up and you, I'm going to make you some stew like, just the way Esau does and you're going to trick your father. We're going to deceive your father in praying the blessing onto you. How many think that's just kind of wrong? Huh? Well, it is wrong. You know what the Bible does? It shows us even the patriarchs of the faith, even those that we esteem, they had flesh just like ours and they don't do everything right. Listen, this family had family problems. And how many know the Bible says the the, uh, sins of the fathers and the mothers are passed down to the third and even the fourth generation. How many know that? How many know whatever you do and you, your children watch you do, they'll inherit unless you make some changes. Is that true or not? Abraham, for instance, lied about Sarah being not his wife but his sister because he was, a, he was afraid that a king would kill them. Isaac also lied about Rebekah later on. Same kind of sin, same kind of problem, same kind of deception because he saw his father Abraham do that. How many know whatever your kids see you do, they're going to repeat. So how many know we need to break the cycle in our lives? And you know what? When you as a parent, you do something wrong, how many know you need to go to your children and say, I was wrong, I did that wrong, I didn't do it right? Susan, I have four children. None of them have wings. None of them have halos. They're all grown They're all married. We have four grandchildren now. But you know what? We've had to do all of our life. When we messed up, yes, I pastor a church. That doesn't mean I'm not going to say something wrong. I'm not going to do something I'm ashamed of. When I did it, and Susan saw it, my children saw it, I don't know how many times I had to go to their bedroom, fall on my knees and say, Daddy did it wrong. I am so sorry. And I ask you to forgive me. If you don't do that, how many know your sins can pass down to your children? How many hear me? I don't care if you're a father, mother, grandfather, grandmother. You need to do that. How many hear me? So, you know, Rebecca went to, went to Jacob and said, I overheard your daddy. And, you know, he wants that stew. He's going to pray the, the bl- prophetic blessing prayer over your brother. You're going to get it. Son, you're going to get it. She was teaching him. And had been teaching him for 70 years to be a deceptive person to be a swindler, to be a conniver, to be a liar. How many know that's pretty bad? Would you agree? That's pretty bad. And so, you know, he came up to his father and said, well, hey, hey, I, this is Esau. I got you some soup. And Isaac said, is, is that you, Esau? He said, well, yeah, that's me. He said, but you sound like Jacob. Are you real? Oh, oh, yeah. He said, well, come up here and let me smell you. His mama had taken the goat that, that uh, Jacob had killed and had put the goat skins on his arms, on the back of his hands, and had put it on the back of his neck. And then she had gone into uh, Esau's room and had taken Esau's clothes and put them on, and put them on Jacob. And Jacob went to his, to his dad Isaac with the soup that Esau was supposed to have. He said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm Esau, sure. Well, come and let me smell. Well, you sure stink. Man, you smell like you've been outside. Hmm. Then he felt his clothes, felt his arms, felt his hand. Well, you sound like Jacob. You sound like Esau, uh, Jacob, but you feel like Esau. You smell like Esau. And he said, well, I'm Esau. And so he put his hand on him, and he prayed the prophetic prayer of blessing for the firstborn rites over Jacob. Jacob let him do it. Rebekah heard him do it. He ate the soup, loved the soup, gave him some wine, maybe to mix it up a little bit make him a bit tipsy so he wouldn't recognize anything that was wrong. And so he ate it. That was it. It was done. They cleaned up, took the soup bowl to the kitchen, cleared the room, cleared up all the debris. And then before you know it, here comes Esau. He comes out of the field and uh, he's got finally killed an animal. He makes the stew, brings it to his dad. (laughs) Hey, dad, I've got some stew for you and I'm ready for you to pray the prophetic prayer. I said, what are you talking about, son? We just prayed. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. I've been out in the field. What do you mean? And then he found out. Isaac found out that he had been lied to. And then Esau found out that he'd been taken advantage of by that younger brother who had his heel at birth. See, his character never changed. It's really something to, it's really something to see that the Scriptures show the flaws of the men and women of God to let you know that you're going to struggle in life and that your struggles won't keep you from God if you'll keep your heart right. How many hear what I'm saying? 
Esau became so angry at Jacob that he, that he wanted to kill him. He vowed in his heart, I'm going to kill this boy. Rebecca, his mother, heard about it. And she went and told Jacob, said, uh, said you need to get out of here. You don't need to get a girl from any, any of this locale here. None of these people should be in our ancestry. Go back to our relatives. Told her to go back to another location. And uh, you've got an uncle named Laban. I want you to go over there and stay with him. When, and so he did because he's afraid that he was going to lose his life, that his brother Esau was going to kill him. And while he was on the way, Jacob uh, got tired, lay down for the night, went to sleep. And I want you to see the grace of God working in this young man's life. Even though he was a swindler, a liar, a cheat, a conniver, even though he was all of that, when he laid down one night on the way to his uncle's house, God appeared to him in a dream. And he saw a stare a stairway from heaven winding down. And he saw the angels of God coming from heaven and, and going up and down on the ladder right there at his head, signifying that the covenant between him and God was real, that it was right, and that there is another world that we're living for. How many of you know we're not just citizens of, of, of the United States, we're also citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And behind the natural world, there's a spiritual world at work. Yes or no? It's true, y'all. I mean, the angels appeared to Jesus during his wilderness temptations and strengthened him. How many know the angels of God are around you today? Well, Jacob saw the angels, and it was just God saying, Jacob, as much as a mess that you are, as much of a swindler that you are, you know what? I have a purpose, I have a plan, and I have a call for your life. You're doing it all wrong on the outside, but your heart, somehow in a strange twisted way is for me and God saw that how many know God honored that now how many know your chickens are always going to come home to roost and however you treat other people it's going to come back on you how many know Jesus said give and it will be given to you is that right how many know Galatians 6 says you reap what you sow yes or no well you know what uh, uh, Jacob reaped what he sowed, he went to Laban's house and he found a girl that he was in love, that, and he fell in love with. Her name was Rachel. She was beautiful. She had a, a sister that was utterly unattractive in every way somehow. And uh, he saw Rachel and he saw this girl named Leah. And he just didn't like Leah at all. But he fell in love with Rachel, went to Laban and said, you know what, I want to marry your daughter. What's it going to take? He said, seven years of labor. He was reaping what he sowed. He was a trickster and Abram and Laban fooled him as well. And so he spent seven years working for Laban. When the seven years were ended, he said, okay, I'm ready for Rachel. I've been watching her all these seven years. I'm ready to get married. And uh, so he got married that night. They put a veil over the bride's face. He, they, they had their night together as husband and wife. Woke up the next morning. It wasn't Rachel in bed with him. It was Leah. And he said, you rascal, you tricked me, you fooled me. And he said, never in Israel. And they had a custom, the firstborn daughter gets married before the next ones. And there's an order to it. And he said, I couldn't let uh, Rachel get married before Leah, so I had to give you. Leah said, well, I love Rachel. What do I need to do for her? He said, work seven more years. Yeah, rascal. Now, before you, your mind goes tw twist when you read the Old Testament, yes, you read the Old Testament narrative and it looks like polygamy for a period of time was the order of the day and somehow God just stood back and let that happen. While that is true, let me just say every single story in the Bible of polygamy, every single family had trouble because it's wrong to have one man with multiple wives. How many hear me? When you do that, you're asking for trouble. Most men take, can't take care of one wife, much less a bunch. How many hear what I'm saying? So, I mean, you know, you got to understand. And, and, and then, you know, think about Solomon. He had, he had 700 wives and 300 slave girls. I mean, that's nuts. This guy had a problem, would you say? So anyway, um, Jacob spent 20 years under Laban's tutelage, and he had to do it, and he was being just dished out what he had been dishing out to everybody else all of his life. From age 80 to age 100, he stayed in Laban's household. And then the biblical story is really quick. I'm coming to a fairly quick conclusion here. At 100 years old, after uh, Jacob had bunches of kids, 
with all of these concubines and, you know, uh, Leah had multiple kids. Rachel had none. Finally, she had Joseph. Finally, he had all of these children said, I, Laban, I got to leave you. He stayed with him for 20 years. He was taken advantage of by Laban. And during those 20 years, you know what God was dealing with uh, Jacob about? Look at what you've been doing. Look how you've been swindling everybody else. Look how you've been swindling. Look how you swindled the birthright from your brother. Look how you're taking advantage of other people. Your mother taught you this, but these kind of behaviors are absolutely wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. 20 years he was working in that household of Laban. And 20 years he had to deal with the sins that he had committed. And then after he left Laban's household, a really amazing thing happened in Jacob's life. Jacob, uh, Jacob had his family. They were, they were headed off to a particular location. And they came to this place called uh, Peniel. And, uh, and Jacob found a guy. They were bedding down for night. But a guy, he found a guy that was a stranger that came into their camp. And he began to wrestle with this stranger. And this guy was really strong that he fought. And he fought and fought for hours and hours. All through the midnight hour up into the early hours of the morning. Somewhere around 5 o'clock in the morning or so. This person revealed himself as an angel of God. And Bible scholars say that this was actually perhaps an appearance of God. In the Old Testament called a theophany. And it could have been Jesus himself that he was wrestling with. But Jacob had such a will. Such a strong, stubborn, I'm going to do it my way will. That he wrestled all night long with this angel. And then finally the angel just pops his hip and pops it out of socket, messes with the muscles in his leg, so much so that, that he can never walk normally again. And he walks with a limp for the rest of his life. And the angel said to Jacob, you know what? You've been a swindler. You've been a liar. You've been a conniver for a hundred years. He was a hundred years old when this happened. He said, but you know what? You met your match tonight. And you know what? Your stubborn will is now broken. Your name is no longer Jacob now your name is Israel. You were a conniver. You were a swindler. But now you've learned your lesson for 20 years in Laban's household. Now you're going to be called from henceforth forever Israel. You've learned your lesson. Now you're a prince with God. Isn't that awesome? Jacob had 12 sons. We call them the children of Israel. Israel. Every time you say the name Israel, you know what you're saying? It's the grace of God that causes you to be what you are. And when the biblical narrative talks about the God of Jacob, it's talking about a God who will follow you all of your life with all of your flaws, all of your consistencies, all of your misdeeds. If your heart is right and if you'll finally yield to him, God will use you in the ways he intended to use you. How many think that's pretty good news? A lot of people think, well, if I'm perfect, God will use me. God can never use perfect people. Why? There are no perfect people. There are just trophies of the grace of God that God uses. So how many know that a hundred for, think about it, for a hundred years, Jacob's character was so twisted, so messed up. I mean, just so out of character from what God needed for him to be. But God chased him for a hundred years because he saw something in Jacob's heart. Because Jacob wanted that, that right of the firstborn. It was saying there was a spiritual value in Jacob's life. And that spiritual value came of age. When Jacob finally yielded himself to God by wrestling the angel all, all night. And you know, it's not without reason that in every single gospel, everybody here, y'all, I hope y'all are listening. You're just real quiet. I'm about to close, but listen. Every gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, twice in the gospel of Matthew, uh, once in the uh, gospel of, I think, Mark uh, chapter 8, Mark chapter maybe, uh, in Mark 8, then Luke 8, Luke 14, and then Luke 12, uh, John 12. Every single gospel records Jesus saying, if any man will come after and follow me, he must take up his cross, give up his life, take up his cross and follow me. And Jesus over and over again, every gospel, he that keeps his life will lose it. He who loses his life will find it. Bottom line, he was addressing the will saying, if you want my best for you, you've got to give up what you like in deference to what I want for you. And if you'll do that, you'll get the best that God has for you. 
See, that's a pattern all throughout Scripture. Abram had to give up his family. Isaac, Isaac gave up his reputation. His name was Laughter. Jacob had to be willing to give up the swindling, the conniving, the lying, the cheating. And he had to be able, he had to be willing to give up his own will. And it took him a hundred years to do it. If God followed Jacob a hundred years, will God follow you in your life if you want to do the right thing on the inside, but you just do it wrong sometimes? Yes, he will. Is that good news? See, see a lot of people think, well, that pastor, God can use that pastor, but, but God just can't use me because I'm flawed. All of us are flawed. All of us have some Jacob in us. How many hear me? And all of us need the cross applied to our life. Uh, Two things happen on a cross. A cross is a place where flesh dies. You may have flesh problems. You may have things that are inconsistent in your life with Jesus. And you know they are. Maybe everybody in your family think you're doing everything just right. And you're an upstanding believer. But if they knew in the background, behind closed doors, you were acting this way or doing this or doing that, they would be appalled and amazed. God knows. But you say, but I've got a heart for God. Yes, you do. And God will follow you if you have a heart for him. Even if your flesh messes up. Is that good news or what? It's what happened to Jacob. Cross is a place where flesh dies. Then a cross, lastly, is a place where human will and God's will meets. God wins. Jacob finally, after a hundred years, said, God, you've been chasing me a hundred years. I've been swindling for a hundred years and now I've been swindled for 20 years by my Uncle Laban. You know what, God? I give up. He wrestled that angel all night for hour after hour after hour after hour. Finally got so tired in his flesh, said, God, you know what? I lose. He changed his name for eternity to Israel. Prince with God. My encouragement to all of us today. God's wanting to do some fresh things in the body of Christ. God's wanting to use every single one of us to make an impact and a difference in our families, in our community, at the place of business. God's going to do some amazing things in the years to come. And we have a, a, a period, a window of time right now that God is pursuing us like he pursued Jacob. He's saying, and he's saying, give me all of you, not just part of you. Right now, American culture is all about doing what I want to do when I want to do it, regardless of how it affects another person. God is asking every single one of us to come away from our culture, come away from the demands of our culture, come away from what is common and normal, come and and fall at his feet. And like Jacob, after he's wrestled with that angel, give our heart life and give our whole self to him. How many want to do that? How many know it's important today? If we want God's best, there is no other avenue except humility, just like Jacob did. It took him 100 years. It's not going to necessarily take us 100 years. I don't care what age you are. You may be in your teens. You may be in your 20s. You may be in your 30s, your 40s, like I'm starting to hit the sixth decade of my life a couple of months from now. I don't care if you're in your 70s or 80s. God wants to use every human life. And God deals with all of us in the same way. There's always a time when God speaks to you. You have a heart for God. And then he challenges your character. God spoke to Joseph when he was 17 years old. And said, you're going to lead your whole family. And eventually he became one of the leaders in in Egypt. But it took 13 years of being in prison for that to happen. God spoke to Moses. And Moses knew at a young age that God had called him to deliver his Hebrew brethren out of of the bondage of Egypt. At 40 years of age, he did it all wrong and he killed a man. And for 40 years, he tended his father-in-law Jethro's sheep. For 40 years, God honed his character. God took the self, the self, the self motivation out of Moses' life. And finally, at 80 years of age, Moses saw the bush. And he saw that God had called him. And, and God had so honed his life in 40 years that he felt like he couldn't speak, even though he had been trained to be eloquent as a, as a youth. And on and on and on I could go. God called the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. 
And when the apostle Paul came to Jesus, he was the, one of the most educated men of his day. And he thought he had the world by the tail. But you know what? When Jesus appeared to him, he saw that he had nothing. And it took years and years before Paul ever went into ministry for God to burn out all of the self-mess out of Paul's life until he could finally say in the book of Galatians, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Jesus lives in me. The God of Jacob is pursuing every one of us today. I don't care what inconsistencies you have in your life. I don't care what you face in your person. If you have a heart for God, God wants to use you. Stand up on your feet. Y'all get something out of that? Yeah.